So, uh, let's start with uh, a map of this presentation. We'll uh, go a very quick tour on the um, category theory and why it's important for functional programming. Oh, can I ask you how many of you are kind of using uh, functional programming right now? Okay, so it's uh, kind of a beginner. <laughs> And how many of you have uh, heard about uh, the word uh, monad? And how many of you are kind of confident to explain what a monad is? Okay, nobody. <laughs> I, I hope uh, that uh, it's really not uh, that difficult. I hope that at least uh, if it's not uh, this um, talk, uh, after this talk uh, you can uh, um, study yourself and understand better. So the goal of this presentation is basically not to let you fall asleep. And yeah. As a secondary goal, I would like also to have uh, people uh, start looking at functional programming and then uh, studying uh, category theory. And uh, it's okay if you don't understand everything. And uh, it's more like uh, a quick tool than uh, to raise your curiosity. But of course, I mean, yeah, I hope uh, that you can understand uh, at least uh, the main point. Oh, let's go very quickly. This is historical. So what is a category theory? Very quickly is uh, something about this called uh, uh, general abstract nonsense, which is not a bad thing. That means that is uh, something that is general. Is it abstract? And it doesn't have a specific meaning because it can apply to all the stuff. And the category theory is actually using uh, physics, quantum dynamics, uh, it's using mathematics, uh, and also in functional programming. So category theory in, in force is very, very high level. And uh, I don't know if you know this uh, comic. It's called uh, Kevin and Dobbs, uh, one my favorite one. And uh, there is uh, this um, stuffed toy with a tiger that when uh, some uh, uh, adult uh, is present, it's always a stuffed toy, but when uh, the uh, kid is alone, then became alive. And so this is a kind of transformation. And uh, at the end of the day, category theory is all about transformations. But transformation that keep some properties. So it's not just any possible transformation. And let's start with the definition. So to have a what is a category since it's category theory? So we have uh, a collection of uh, something called object, which has absolutely nothing to do with uh, uh, programming uh, object. Something called arrows that uh, kind of uh, link object between them. And it arrows collect one object to another. And uh, the arrows must also have a property that uh, you can, you must, I mean, you must be able to compose them. Otherwise, uh, I mean, if each arrow is absolutely not composable, it's not a category. But if uh, all arrows are composable, then that means that uh, they have also to be composable and also to have a associative um, property. And also there must be an identity arrows that basically applying the arrows to any object, it will keep the object that it is. I mean, it's very basic uh, requirement, it's not much. So we can do a kind of, uh, I mean, I'm coming, I live in London. So in London, we have uh, the underground the tube. And uh, we can imagine that the objects are the station of the tube and arrows are the uh, travel routes. And each arrow is connecting to a station. And uh, you comp can compose the arrows because you can go in the, so for example, if you go from uh, Bond Street uh, to Oxford Circus uh, and then from Oxford Circus to Tottenham Court Road, uh, you can compose those two arrows to have a high level arrows. And uh, you can keep composing them. And this is already make a category. So it's nothing really difficult. And uh, at the same time, also a functional programming language is also a category. But there is a one thing that is uh, keep uh, you have to keep in mind is that uh, types are objects, so not a specific instance, but types like uh, integer or string or user or whatever. 
and the function are morphism. So morphisms is uh, exactly the same as arrows. So this talk is always about arrows and morphism. So you have a uh, string length, for example, is an arrow that uh, takes a string and return an integer, which is incidentally the uh, length of the string. But on uh, category theory, is that is not really important. What is important is that you can compose without the arrows that uh, take the integer and transform in something else. Um, well, one uh, small uh, caveat for uh, functional programming is that uh, differently from mathematical, we have uh, these things called uh, partial functions. So there are some functions that are de uh, undefined for some value. For example, if you take a function with the two values and uh, divide the first uh, by the second, the second must be different from zero. Otherwise, uh, you have an error. And uh, the possible errors are what we call exception in our uh, in Java, for example. Or um, it could also, also be a, a, an infinite loop. Uh, this is also a kind of error. So this kind of uh, mean that uh, there is for when we talk about the category in programming language, uh, there always this bottom type, uh, which is a kind of uh, uh, T. Uh, oh reversed, that is, I mean, all function can also potentially return this button times, but for the sake of a uh, composability, we kind of put uh, this apart and we really don't want to think about. So this is very, very, I mean, if you are kind of uh, used to object orientation, uh, you know, uh, there is uh, this uh, nice uh, metaphor where an object-oriented, uh, well, uh, uh, what uh, language? I mean, uh, application is a bit uh, like of a living, uh, like a garden or a aquarium, a fish tank, or something like that, where you have an uh, object that communicate each other. They they live their whole lives and uh, they can transform. Uh, okay, in uh, functional programming, this is very different. You have also to change completely the method for because it's something more like. Uh, uh, pipes and gears, cogways, stuff that uh, really have to fit uh, together and uh, it's completely, either it's work or it's completely uh, unworkable. And in uh, object-oriented, you really wanted to keep uh, the state, the inner state of the stuff uh, completely hidden and uh, user communication. So when you communicate with, um, I don't know, connection DB, you say, you really don't want to know what, what is the internal state of uh, the connection. You just want to say, okay, give me this the user with this ID, and it will return the user. And you really don't want to know about what is the one inside. But in functional programming, it's the opposite. Everything is completely transparent. You absolutely see anything that is running, and uh, everything must work with the transformation. So in object orientation, we have uh, in inheritance as one of the most important and polymorphism. In uh, functional programming, we have uh, composition. So we can compose things using other things, but we never hide what is inside. Finally, in uh, object orientation, we have interface. In uh, functional programming, we have type classes, and uh, we go back on this. Now, the example of this talk will be in Kotlin, which is not very important. I mean, I could probably wrote the same talk uh, with example in JavaScript uh, or Scala will be much easier probably. Uh, but I try first uh, to have uh, the example in Java, but it's really hard to read. And the Kotlin is very nice. It's quite similar to Java, so usually people don't have uh, a big shock. And uh, uh, differently, for example, from Clojure or Scala. And uh, these are some of uh, the advantages on uh, Kotlin of Scala for functional programming. So my suggestion is if you really want to try a bit, maybe using Kotlin is a better idea than using S Java. Oh, uh, we don't go, I mean, to all the them, but if you know more. Uh, some examples, so if you are not completely familiar, just a question, how many of you are more or less familiar with the Kotlin syntax? Okay, less than uh, probably one third. 
So there is a just, uh, it's very similar to Java, but uh, there is some caveats. Uh, there's no semicolon. S the type uh, with a question mark is a different type than uh, the type without question mark. With the, the one with the question mark is nullable. The other one is not nullable, but you cannot assign uh, one to the other. Um, if you wanted to pass uh, a lambda, you don't. You have a kind of easier syntax than uh, Java. Basically, using uh, square uh, um, not uh, brackets uh, instead of uh, uh, the, the arrow notation. Uh, instead of uh, in, in Java 10, they are adding the var. But in Kotlin, uh, there is uh, this two way to declare a variable if it's mutable or immutable, which is quite convenient for functional programming. And uh, you don't need uh, the new uh, the new uh, keyword. If you just have uh, to create an object, you just use uh, the type uh, and uh, pass the parameter. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay, but why bother? I mean, why we want to <laughs> to use an object-oriented language for doing functional programming? And well, there is no, I don't have an answer for that, uh, but uh, you have to <laughs> keep trying. It's a good question. And, uh, but I hope that at the end of the uh, presentation, we have uh, some ideas. Um, if you are using Kotlin, there is, uh, of course, you can implement everything yourself, but there is already a library which is already um, ready to, to do all these uh, examples of this book. And, uh, Finally, the there is a, a proposal to add uh, type classes and I uh, kinded types to Kotlin, which is a few things that we'll see later that were quite convenient. And uh, at the moment, they, they are using a kind of a hack to make it work. It will be much better to have implemented in the language. And uh, there is uh, this proposal, which also I'm collaborating to. So if you have some specific question, we can discuss later. Okay, so uh, purity and immutability. Uh, you you know what uh, the what how many you know what a pure function is. Okay, uh, for pure function we we intend a function with us no side effect. That means that uh, whatever are the input uh, they determine the output. Uh, there must be no uh, assessing to internal singleton, internal state, uh, external, uh, even uh, print line is uh, technically a pure function. And of course, when uh, we talk about uh, this kind of composition and uh, mathematics, all the function must be pure because otherwise we cannot be sure that uh, the same input give the same result. And uh, so uh, all the laws that we'll saw we are not working. And for the same reason, we have uh, to use all immutable data. So everything that must be, um, we cannot use map that we can change. So each map must be a, a specific uh, immutable object. And then if we want to change something, how we do? We just create a new map with just one value different. And then there are some tricks, so it's not so inefficient as it sounds. But anyway, just uh, keep in mind that uh, this is very nice and everything, but uh, at the low level, everything uh, is still completely mutable and uh, um, impure. So all this stuff that we wanted to do, be mutable and uh, purity, is only because we wanted to compose them. It's not uh, a value for say. But we'll go back on this one. So the first thing that, the first, uh, beast that we'll uh, talk about uh, is uh, a monoid. So basically, we, we saw this, uh, mo uh, this example of a uh, category. So, but uh, what if we do a category of uh, all the arrows, all the morphism of a category? And uh, basically, it looks more or less like this. This is just uh, to, to think about. So, um, you have uh, a types, and uh, you kind of uh, um, collapse all the types in uh, a single object. 
and then everything that works on the types basically stick working on the same object. So you have a category with just one object and a lot of arrows that works on that object. And um, so when uh, we have a, these arrows must all be arrows of the same kind of type, like uh, for example, the incremental. So we have uh, something that uh, take uh, the object and the return. And um, this kind of a composition, so we if uh, we compose the one incremental with the second incremental, we have uh, like a plus two, or we compose again, we have a plus three and everything. Um, and this is uh, also quite interesting because uh, mm, theoretically this is how they uh, define uh, the set of natural numbers from uh, logic to category theory to mathematics. But this is quite mm, the theoretical. But uh, we have uh, this idea of monoid. So monoid is something that allows uh, to compose ours. And if you want to really squint enough, <laughs> We can also say that uh, the tube map is a kind of monoid because it allows us to quickly compose uh, uh, arrows between places. It's not that difficult. And um, when we have uh, in the code, let's see how we have something that, uh, if it's a monoid, it must be something that allows to combine and uh, have an empty value. So the empty value is the beginning, so we, we can start. And uh, we have uh, something that allows us to combine uh, two, uh, two arrows together. And uh, we, we see some good example. But first, uh, let's go back a second about uh, this discussion about the type class and interfaces. Um, interfaces, when we have an interface, is something that uh, we have uh, two types, cat and dogs, and we say they are both animals. And uh, what can you do with the two animals? Probably they can mate each other. But uh, if we create a, a category, a, an interface animal, we can define uh, some uh, uh, abstract uh, method and then have uh, the implementation. But uh, the um, specific, uh, um, we, we kind of, when, when you use the interface, we, we kind of lose uh, if it's a cat of a dog because we just wanted to talk about animal. And uh, the idea of interface is basically to hide uh, the details and uh, to have a kind of higher level. Instead, in functional programming, we never hide uh, the details. So what do we do with the type classes is basically say, these types have uh, a kind of a similar class. And when we talk about classes, nothing to do with the class. Uh, because types is like a class in object-oriented. This is a bit confusing. So type class is a bit like a meta class in object orientation. But uh, um, with the type class, we said we have a kind of types with a kind of similar way to behave. So we wanted to, uh, to say something generically about uh, these types. But uh, we don't hide the types. So if uh, we say that uh, the cats and dog both uh, share the mate uh, um, type class, uh, well, the type class has an instance that allows to mate. That means th still keep uh, that uh, cats mate with cats and dogs mate with dogs. And uh, if you think about also when uh, we have uh, the equal method in Java, we can do any object equal to any other object. But probably what we really like is to say that uh, a specific object of a specific class can also be equal to its own uh, class. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to say that an integer is equal to a string. I mean, ideally, we really wanted to have a compiler error. Then uh, there is, uh, in object orientation, the concept of uh, inheritance, but we don't have inheritance in functional programming, so we don't really have to worry about uh, I-11. But let's skip about uh, type classes. Interface are similar, but very diffi different. And uh, type classes have an instance. And it's a way to say that uh, when we talk, we talk about sum before, we can say that the sum arrow, uh, we don't say that sum is a monoid. We say that sum as a monoid instance. Because you can create uh, this instance to allow uh, to, to combine uh, to, to sum. And um, also, the technically, when uh, we talk about our code, the instance will be, um, well, we see the code, it's probably easy. 
this is more or less how you write uh, a monoid in uh, Kotlin with some the, the laws, basically, to explain the laws. And uh, there is uh, the instance, which is this uh, monoid string. And the monoid string uh, is just an instance, of course, to concatenate a string. Or you can also have a, a monoid uh, uh, integer that uh, to sum uh, some integer. And um, you can combine them. Yeah, you can combine uh, also from a list, uh, and then uh, you have uh, in, one, uh, in one go. And uh, all these uh, combined methods are method of the instance. That in this way, you can make sure that it works only on the same type. I mean, uh, I know that I'm very quick list, but if uh, there's any question specific, please stop me. <laughs> Anyway, this is just uh, to give you a kind of uh, idea. Let's pretending that uh, we care about. But now, the second um, most um, the second uh, entity that uh, the second type class that we are going to meet is the functor. And uh, while uh, uh, monoid allows us to combine two arrows, functor basically. Uh, allows us to transform uh, transform something something else. And uh, uh, technic uh, usually the definition of functor is something that uh, uh, transforms uh, an arrows from one category to another category. But uh, it also can work in the same category, but still preserving the property. Because functor are more or less like the transformer, so they can transform something in something else, keeping uh, the mm, the properties. And the functor is the most important uh, concept of this talk. If uh, you struggle uh, la later and uh, you don't know exactly, uh, still uh, try to understand the functor first, because once you understand functor, all the rest kind of uh, uh, fit in place. Everything else that we are talking basically, it will be functors. Uh, also monad and everything else. And um, the functor have uh, this uh, kind of laws, also functors laws, and basically say that um, if you to transform in a functor is uh, doing a map, and you probably already know map because it's already in uh, Java 8 with the streams and another lot of other um, libraries. But the idea of a map is uh, about functor, so also this talk is about if you learn a bit about the category theory, it's also a bit easier to understand the new uh, libraries and frameworks. So the, the idea is that uh, if you have an, an ID function, and uh, that just an ID function is a function that returns the same value that you put as an input, uh, it must be um, guaranteed that uh, ID x is uh, equal x. So you cannot have something in map that say, if something then do something else or add a value plus one or stuff like that. It must be exactly apply the function to it. And uh, if you are composing two function, it must be exactly the same result that uh, apply map on one function and uh, the other function then compose the result. And uh, before London, I was living in Milano. And we can kind of imagine that, uh, to give you an idea of a functor, that we have a functor that move place from Milano to London. So we have uh, the Duomo, the main church in Milano, and uh, we move to St. Paul. The Castello becomes the Tower of London, Palazzo Reale became Buckingham Palace. But uh, we can also move uh, the arrows. So if we have an arrow that say, going from Duomo to Palazzo Reale, our functor must be able to transform this is that go to from uh, um, St. Paul to Buckingham Palace. I mean, we don't care about the details, but this is how functors stay. They translate, but uh, they keep uh, the structure. And also it must be identical if uh, we apply one step to, or to another. I mean, if you go from Duomo to Castello, then Palazzo Reale must be exactly the same result that uh, from Castello to Palazzo Reale and then from Duomo to Castello. And uh, when we talk about programming, because we said that uh, our programming language is a single category, 
all the functors that we have uh, basically are the functors in our category because we are not transforming from one language to another. So it's those are functions are called uh, endo function because basically they stay in the same category. But even if they stay in the same category, there is a, a kind of a transformation because that is uh, the functor uh, idea. So what uh, we basically do, we 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 use something. We create a type based on another type because remember that in category types are the object. So we, we take a one type uh, that will be like uh, the Duomo in Milan, and we create a new type that will be like uh, the Duomo in Milan. And uh, what we call uh, generics in Java, in the functional world, uh, we call a uh, type constructor. Because the idea is that uh, in Java, we kind of tend to say something like list of t, whatever is t, like uh, a generic uh, abstraction of a list. In a uh, functional uh, world, instead, we focus on uh, the list of t. It's just uh, a constructor that allows us to construct, uh, to create, uh, to build specific types, like a list of int, a list of string, and everything. What we cannot do in Java, which is, is a pity for uh, functional programming uh, perspective, is that uh, we cannot say, I want uh, a list of A of a B. can be like uh, a list uh, of uh, a set of integer. I mean, we can have a, a list of set of integer, but we cannot leave A and B as a generics. We can only have uh, one level of, uh, of generics in Java. Or in functional programming, what we, s mm, we use a lot is uh, to not specify the second uh, uh, in a level. So we say, this is a list of uh, something that needs uh, something else. So it can be a list of a set uh, that will be of some specific type, or it can be a list uh, of list uh, of a specific type, or other stuff like that. And uh, this concept, uh, uh, like a generics of a generics, uh, metagenerics, is called higher kind of types. And uh, it's quite useful when you do um, operation of functor. Because if functor is something that take an A and return a list of A, if you wanted to take a functor or a functor, you needed to be able to generalize more. And uh, this is something that uh, they are discussing now to uh, put inside the Kotlin. But right now there is a kind of hack, so it kind of works. And this is how functor uh, works. So probably one of the most useful uh, example in uh, and you probably already know about because it's quite useful is uh, this try how many of you have uh, heard about uh, the try yes uh, it's basically is an idea of a, of a type class uh, over the exception so instead of having something that uh, can return an exception which is something that you remember the button type something that we really don't want in functional programming we we use uh, the try uh, and so the try basically wrap around uh, the um, the computation and can either return a success like in, in the first case or a failure. In this way, instead of uh, returning like uh, an integer, but uh, can be also an, an error, we can return a try of an integer that we'll have internally. But uh, the whole point of a uh, functor is that transformation, remember. So let's go back. Um, another way to see functor is called the, the lift, uh, the fork lift. So if you have a function that goes to from A to B, let's say from integer to string, you can uh, have uh, a functor that transforms something that uh, goes from FDA to FDB, for example, from a list of uh, integer to a list of string. And uh, in this way, basically, we transform uh, the try on uh, of a string uh, in a, in a try of a number of an integer, which is completely stupid at uh, this example. But if you think that uh, you can take uh, the try from a previous cal calculation and store in a variable and then transform in another try, it can be actually useful because you can use the other try to to do something else. And uh Okay, this is a bit. This is quite uh, difficult uh, to understand uh, the first time. 
You can also have a functor, not only over a type, but over a function. So you have a function, in this case, that uh, take uh, a URL and they return a connection of the DB, which is something like uh, that we will do probably with the dependency injection. And what you can do, you can uh, create a, a functor that is called reader, because it's kind of a typical uh, functor, uh, one of the most famous, most useful. And uh, basically, you do this uh, run that uh, you create the reader with the, the function that you want. Then uh, the run basically start the functor, and then you can uh, uh, use the mm, uh, basically transform the result. So you can use uh, this uh, map uh, to, to get uh, the result that you want. In this case, uh, the username. Of course, uh, the code like this uh, seems uh, quite uh, uh, without any point, but uh, you have uh, to remember that you can compose and you have uh, you can pass stuff around, uh, and then uh, you can have uh, the injection of the comp the string connection, for example, in a completely different module that uh, do the actual uh, logic. Okay, another step. So we have uh, the function. Um, that transform data. We have uh, the functors that uh, transform functions. So what if we want to transform a functors? We have something that is called natural transformation. So going back to our example, if uh, we wanted to switch from uh, London to Paris, we have a functor that goes from uh, Palazzo Reale to Buckingham Palace, and another functor that goes from uh, Palazzo Reale to Versailles, because that is uh, the Paris uh, subcategory. And uh, it's the same with the, with the church. But then uh, what if I want to say, okay, let's take one functor like uh, Buckingham Palace and transform in Versailles. And this is uh, a kind of uh, operation transformation of uh, the functors, which is called uh, natural transformation. And uh, actual natural transformation is uh, something that is came before uh, um, category theory, but is uh, from mathematics. On, uh, on the code is something that is quite trivial, to be honest, which is uh, basically we have uh, this try that we talked uh, before, and uh, we can transform this try in an option, which is another, uh, um, another type class, or we can also transform uh, the option in a list. So basically, we have a try into a list, and this is a natural transformation. And uh, if uh, the try is uh, a positive value, something like a uh, three to int is a positive try, I mean, is a success try, we have uh, the list uh, with the sign three. But if it's uh, something that it cannot be transformed in integer, so it will be a, an exception, transforming in list will be um, an empty list. Of course, doing this transformation, we lose uh, the um, information about uh, the, uh, the exception, for example, in this case. There could be some losing, but uh, the structure is uh, maintained. Okay. Ah. <laughs> Nobody is sleeping yet. <laughs> um, what uh, if uh, now we put uh, together the idea of a uh, monoid and the functor that uh, we saw till now? So, um, Monoid is uh, about uh, to, to combine the uh, two things, and uh, we can combine the uh, two factor in basically two ways. One is uh, like addition, so we have uh, something of uh, something else. So we have uh, a function inside the factor, a value inside the factor, and we put it together. On the other is uh, we have uh, the multiplication, so we put the factor inside another factor. Let's see the first case first. Um, so basically, if we let's just look at the, the last uh, point. If you have a function that uh, from A to B and uh, a, a functor of A, we can create a functor of B. We can also create, uh, if you have, uh, this the second way is exactly the I identical way to, um, is uh, uh, you can transform easily, and uh, it's useful if you have a function with two parameters. And uh, for example, with uh, the code, uh, this is, uh, we use that applicative in black is our instance. And uh, we can transform uh, uh, some tries in uh, a tuple 
of a of a tie. So basically, we combine uh, we combine uh, the the tuple function have a uh, multiple parameter, and so we can combine multiple uh, functor in uh, a single functor, which is uh, the success of the failure, which it has inside uh, the tuple with all the value. But uh, okay, let's uh, on the other side. What uh, we if uh, we did uh, the same things of a monoid, and uh, we have uh, this. Uh, idea of, okay, let's create a category with all the endo functors. We need endo factors because we need to compose each other, so it cannot be functor from a category to another. They must work on the same category. So we have uh, all this endo functor, and uh, we create uh, a new category with only the endo functor. And this is what is monad. The monad is nothing else that uh, the idea of uh, uh, composing together the end of functor exactly in the same way that the monoid uh, compose together the function. And uh, the um, monad uh, main uh, uh, method are the unity, which is something that uh, allows us to create uh, the monad in the first place. And uh, the multiplication, so something that uh, if you have a functor of another functor of A, we can uh, kind of collapse the two functors and uh, having just a factor. In a kind of mathematical notation, they have uh, this kind of, um, they can, they can uh, mu the multiplication and eta the creation. And um, they say that uh, the diagram commute, that means that everything must be exactly the same. And this is uh, a, a graphical way to explain uh, the loads of the monad. And um, so there is um, many kind of uh, monads, um, which are just the most uh, useful and uh, kind of famous one. Um, nothing prevent you to extend of to if you have uh, some uh, specific uh, requirement. So each monad basically has uh, the basic monad uh, package, the one that we saw, the creation uh, and the multiplication. Wi multiplication is called a flat map. And also all the monads are also applicative, so they also have the supply. And also the all the monads are, are functors, so all the monads also have a map. And uh, on top of that, each of uh, these monads has a specific uh, something specific uh, to this specific monad that allows you to do some uh, um, some operation on a bit more. The probably the most important, at least historically, has been the IO monad, the last from uh, the one from the last, because it's the monad that allows in uh, functional programming to do um, side effect. Uh, for example, if you wanted to read from the standard out or standard in or write to the standard out. And that's bring us to the bindings, which is a kind of a dance of a monads. That is uh, really the thing that kind of uh, renewed uh, the functional programming uh, under 2000. So, And basically what bindings allows us is uh, if uh, we have uh, this um, composition of monads, for example, we wanted to um, have uh, this I.O. monad to go to fetch stuff from outside, uh, then from a student we want to get the university, from the university we wanted to get the dean. We have uh, to create uh, this uh, strange, uh, uh, I mean, not so nice uh, flat map uh, in nesting uh, stuff, but uh, using the bindings uh, um, uh, strengthen, we can uh, basically flatten that and uh, be sure that uh, when uh, this final band uh, of is this line basically we refer to the previous uh, uh, element. Well, not to the previous element, but to, to, to the same IO monad. And um, let's see a specific uh, code example, which is uh, again uh, with the reader monad. And if you have a function that uh, get the user to be given a DB connection, which is the that user from context, and note that uh, when we write the get user from context, we really don't have uh, nothing about the DB connection. We just have a know that it is an interface, a DB con, that there will be some 
implementation behind. So this is kind of object orientation hiding stuff. And then uh, when uh, we bind, uh, basically, we can bind uh, uh, together with the space and uh, having something like that, say, user one, uh, get Frank, user two, get the journey, then combine uh, the two names. And then uh, when uh, this uh, EV that is evaluated, this is something specific to Kotlin. Um, you don't need that in Haskell, but uh, just uh, Basically, what's happened is that uh, the bindings is uh, creating in parallel. So if it's possible, at least it will fetch both of them uh, uh, in parallel. And then uh, um, it runs all this stuff, uh, it runs on a specific uh, DB connection that we can define later. But of course, if we return uh, just the first block, just the reader monad, we can define the, until we call uh, uh, evaluation one, we don't do as absolutely anything. So we, we can keep uh, composing our logic without uh, going to the database. And only when we have a proper everything uh, put aside, let's say, and someone else will run the stuff on a specific database and we get the return. Um, so how we can use uh, morphism in uh, real world programming? Well, we can uh, still explore. There's uh, really, really a lot of uh, one uh, thing that I uh, really to think about is that, yeah, purity and all the stuff that we saw is very nice and everything, but it's uh, not a goal for us. Uh. And um, perfectly pure programs are perfectly useless. Remember that, I mean, the whole point of a purity immutability is only that uh, allows us to compose the stuff uh, and then run outside, but uh, it's not that uh, pure as a, a some value for say because at the end uh, we wanted to solve problems, real problems for real customer. And uh, for example, one kind of architecture, not the design that I think that it works quite well, is that uh, if you have this kind of purity bubbles, then you can pass this stuff uh, between actors and the actors will uh, do some uh, uh, dirty work. This is also, I mean, inspired by uh, Erlanger, his work more or less. Is. So you keep uh, the, um, the purity on the model composition, and that's why you want the purity, immutability, and blah, blah, blah. But when uh, you do actual, uh, um, you go outside the bubble, then you do the uh, side effect works, and you go to fetch data. So we already arrived to the conclusion. <laughs> Why functional programming? Um, I don't think it's because uh, code is with that right. <laughs> I mean, even after I'm, I'm doing this stuff for some years now, and I still uh, struggle to to read the code the first time. And so it's not that um, that's the point. But I'm still quite convinced that is a really good thing. And uh, so this is kind of a comparison. And in uh, left uh, is uh, the good things, and the right is uh, the bad things about functional programming. Uh, what uh, I see is that uh, when uh, you do functional programming, you start to think much more about uh, the data that you have, uh, the problem that you have to solve. You don't put uh, kind of a corner case under the carpet until later. You have to compose this transformation and uh, take all the possible result and try to have uh, types that actually reflect the data that you need. And this definitely comport less bugs and uh, much less testing because uh, most of the unit tests that we write, uh, I mean, I'm a really big fan of unit testing, but most of the unit testing is kind of uh, corner cases. So we want to test uh, all the possible corner cases. When we work with functional programming, basically, we tend not having corner case. So doing uh, testing, uh, uh, I mean, is a sum uh, how many kind of uh, different number you want to put, because there is really no corner case that you really want to test. It also simplifies currency, and um, I found that you really have uh, less bugs, but you really takes more time to go at that point. And uh, at some point, uh, the state uh, of your program, because we are doing real programs that solve real problems, is very complicated. That's why I kind of suggest that 
actors idea that the bub purity bubbles are not so too big because otherwise you have really struggled to keep a very, very complex state. At some point the state became so complicated uh, that it's really uh, a problem to keep. And uh, there has some performance issue, but uh, don't be afraid because I mean, it's performance issue if you want to do something like uh, a video game or real time, uh, incredibly fast stuff. I mean, you really want to squeeze out any uh, cycle from the CPU. In that case, functional programming has still some problems. But uh, if you do normal pro uh, programming, like uh, taking stuff from DB, uh, operating uh, using the output, uh, the overhead of uh, functional programming is basically nothing. I mean, doing a REST API using functional style or not functional style has absolutely no change uh, in the performance. Uh, so, okay. Uh, we assume that they convince someone about the functional programming. What about the category theory? I think that uh, if you are kind of serious on functional programming, you should at least give a try to study uh, the category theory because it's um, really, really important and uh, really um, to learn how to think about uh, and uh, to kind of train your mind on, um, on the kind of shape, uh, transformation, and uh, keep uh, uh, all this stuff in your head, uh, which is a very, very difficult, uh, not too difficult, but it's very different from uh, object orientation. And also that is a bit uh, like uh, um, design patterns in uh, object orientation, that design patterns something that you should uh, emerge from your code. It's not something that uh, I'm going to write uh, a builder of a strategy of a bridge uh, with a facade. But uh, it's something that your code uh, kind of tends there and then you clean up. In the same way, uh, monads and other type classes should really emerge from your code. So you, you start writing some uh, functional code and then you say, hey, this piece I can uh, simplify and uh, replace all this code with just a monad. Because I'm just generalizing uh, on, on a general concept. Okay, any question? Or this is uh, some uh, links if you wanted to to learn more. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that that's depend on how uh, this is the same thing that uh, in Scala you do with the for comprehension, in Haskell you do with the do notation, and uh, that depend how is implemented, how the uh, binding instance is created, and um, I think there are already in that I mean it's going in that library is also have uh, two um, uh, um, implementation. One is uh, parallel and one is um, one is concurrent and one is uh, not concurrent. And of course, yeah, also future uh, is a kind of monad, if you want, so you can combine those. Okay, <laughs> thank you everybody. And any question, you can uh, tweet at me or email, uh, log, blog, whatever.